is widely accepted as the father of Los Altos. As a railroad executive and land developer, he played an important role in the birth of Los Altos. He left his mark on our town in many, many ways. Hello, I'm Nan Geschke, your host of the Los Altos History Show. Our guests tonight are Stevie and John Day. Stevie and John have actually been neighbors of my husband and I and our family for many years. And uh, their home was next to ours on University Avenue. Stevie and John have lived in Los Altos for about 35 years, and they've lived in the home, the Paul Schaub home, uh, for about 27 years, correct? Mm -hmm. right. right. And we know that the home is very important uh, as, as, as a piece of classical architecture, but it's also important and has been designated a town landmark because of its association with Paul Schaub. And there's been a lot of sort of misconceptions about Paul Schaub. And, and uh, I know that you and Stevie, John, have done some research and have talked to some of the descendants of Paul and maybe could sort of clear up some of these misconceptions for us tonight. What, what do you have to share? I know that there's, it's a large, big story. It's so a we, won't be big. Able, we won't be able to get over to, to, to give us, mm -hmm. to tell the whole story, but let's just, let's, let's just hit the important points. Well, Paul's a very interesting person. Uh, his, his life and times were very active. Uh, it's a, a Horatio Alger story in the sense that he came literally from uh, a paper boy to uh, president of the Southern Pacific. So it was uh, a quite a, a, a totally involved story. He grew up in San Bernardino. And uh, actually, after he finished high school, uh, he went to work at age 17 uh, for the Southern Pacific as a ticket agent. Uh, he actually worked for a little while with Santa Fe before that, but uh, as a ticket agent, he showed a lot of skill and apparently attracted a lot of attention. Uh, among his skills, he, he turns out to be very good at shorthand. He was a stenographer and telegra telegrapher and interesting, uh, very interesting kind of a person. But uh, after about five years down there, he was promoted and moved up to Northern California. Uh, and he had a, uh, they called him uh, ticket agent, assistant ticket agent in San Francisco. And this is our vocabulary today. He was the uh, assistant marketing manager. Ah, oh, OK. <laughs> for the uh, passenger trains. Uh, and one particular train, now this is at age 22. Uh, he, Fairly young man. Uh, indeed. He was the ticket agent or promoting a particular train they had that went from San Francisco to New Orleans. Uh, it was called the Sunset Limited. I love it. And uh, the Sunset Limited, they needed more passengers. It was a new uh, train. Route, a new route, too. And the, uh, so they came up with a promotional piece. Uh, and they called it Sunset Magazine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, at the age of about uh, 22, uh, Paul started writing articles. And uh, oh, obviously, this became what we know today as Sunset Magazine. It's kind of interesting to know that it started out as a railroad promotional piece, because now we only think of it as a living and design magazine for the West. Well, he was trying to show all the scenic attractions on the route that would attract readership and get passengers and uh, build up revenue. Sure. Well, this attracted a lot of attention, and it was so good that they promoted him and sent him down to San Jose as the uh, freight and passenger agent in San Jose. And uh, by, you know, he was down there uh, at the age of about, uh, well, this was, 
about the late 20s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, his late 20s. His, he was 20. He was well, 20. Also, he was, he was, yes. His late 20s. But what I'm leading to is that um, he had met a young woman in San Francisco who was the daughter of a, uh, a railroad engineer. Uh, and her name was Rose Wilson. And uh, eventually he ended up marrying Rose and uh, they had three children. Now, so she had railroad connections too. Well, her father actually was present in Promontory, Utah at the time they drove the Golden Spike. Wow, I uh, guess she did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a construction engineer mm -hmm. and actually was an advisor in the construction of the cable cars up in San Francisco. Uh, but enough of Wilson, yeah. we're talking about the Shalps. Um, Rose and uh, Paul lived down in San Jose, uh, in the Nagley part of San Jose, which is uh, between, it's actually between 11th and 17th Street uh, behind uh, uh, San Jose State. And uh, in that area, and this was uh, in the early, this was about 1907. Anyway, uh, in that area, uh, there were a number of houses built by uh, two architects, uh, uh, Wolf and McKenzie. And uh, Wolf and McKenzie were, uh, had actually published a book in 1907. They had built hundreds of houses mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Santa Cruz to Palo Alto, all over. And uh, they attracted her attention so that when their third child was born, um, they decided that they needed a new house. So they actually built uh, what is our present house uh, in 1910. And uh, that was, but that's really getting ahead of the story yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I uh, mean, he, w he was, uh, I know that he was involved in a land company, correct? Well, he, his career actually, see, I, I skipped over yeah. it, but he was in Oregon for a while as a freight person. And then he was brought back to uh, the Northern California area and became an assistant manager of the, uh, what was then called the Pacific Electric Railroad. And mm -hmm. it was the, uh, it was the metropolitan uh, interurban or uh, trolley electric system that uh, included uh, Northern California and uh, subsequently, as you'll learn, Southern California. But at the time, he was in charge of uh, San Jose, uh, Fresno, Stockton, uh, this, this Oakland area. So he had a lot of responsibility. At that time, yes. Yeah. And he was very much on a fast track, moving through the hierarchy of the railroad. But what's important is that he was the railroad executive in charge of the network in Northern California. And uh, this was actually at a very, I mean, he was still, I think, in his low 30s mm -hmm. at this point. Well, uh, one of the problems was that they had this track, uh, electric track, between uh, what is now South Palo Alto, uh, or they called it Mayfield, and Los Gatos. And the track had been installed somewhere along the way, but uh, there was no station uh, on that track between uh, Mayfield and uh, Los Gatos. And, you know, when you want to build ridership, you've got to have some stations in the middle, some depots. Does you know. help. <laughs> and uh, there was need of a depot, but at the moment there was no location. Well, uh, we don't know all the details, and I should say in the meantime, this was about, this started out in 1906 when he was up in San Francisco helping with the earthquake. Actually, he was very much involved in uh, traffic and management uh, from the Southern Pacific's point of view uh, in the restoration of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. But about this time, he and, uh, we don't know exactly when they formed this land company, but Paul Schaup and a group of men uh, formed a company, and the first thing they did was they apparently either bought or acquired the rights to buy what was then called the Miramac Miraman yeah. uh, Ranch. Now, the Miraman Ranch was on the west side of the tracks. And it is the, uh, it was what we know today, bounded by uh, El Monte, Foothill Expressway, and over uh, to the creek, mm -hmm. actually to uh, Dobie Creek. Now, and apparently there was some part of that ranch that was on the other side of 
the tracks, but it was a small parcel, relatively. Now, Mrs. Winchester had bought 150 acres, and I don't know when she bought it, but she had bought 150 acres on the other side of the tracks. Um, and she was Mrs. Merriman's sister. That's yes, right. The two were yeah, sisters. Sisters, right. And it, it may have been that they bought these two ranches so they'd be close together. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes sense. But uh, nonetheless, um, this team of people, who I don't think at that time had really called themselves the Los Altos Land Company, but it eventually became the Los Altos mm -hmm. Land Company, um, apparently made a deal with Mrs. Winchester and acquired at least uh, 100 acres. I, they may have gotten it all, but a big chunk of her land, which is adjacent to the railroad tracks, and which is now today downtown Los Altos. Right. And I think, I just uh, not, not to interrupt you, John, but I know that the um, uh, we, we want to show some slides of, of how some of those lots were sold. Um, I know that, that the land company sort of went through a couple of iterations, and we had talked about that in terms of, you know, mortgaging, mortgages being re, yeah. refinanced and so forth. Well, see, Nan, the key thing was that the depot had to be installed. Right. And, of course, Mr. Schaup decided where the depots went. And by pure chance, he put it in the middle of his property. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, huh? Very interesting. Yeah. I think we have some uh, slides up on the monitor right now. And this first one is of uh, Paul Schaup and probably a couple of his, his land company uh, uh, cohorts uh, looking at uh, probably a subdivision uh, plot map, uh, and that's that was where they um, actually uh, sold lots, and there was actually nothing on on the property on Main Street. This is a a, a slide of a barbecue that was held in uh, 1908 when uh, the first railroad actually came down first through steam here. Engine. First steam, steam engine came down through Los Altos, and this is another uh, shot of that uh, that day and. Uh, Says we are we are Los Altos, so uh, there were there were a lot of promotional tours down into this area uh, by Paul Schaup and the land developers, and this was one of the buildings that he um, built on Main Street. It's now the Eureka Bank, but it was a Robinson's grocery store, and above uh, was the uh, was once used as the first grammar school, and then became the Boy Scout Hall. Um, Anyway, I know that uh, we've talked a little bit now about Paul and uh, uh, about his, his, his beginning career, and I know that we could say a whole lot more. But um, Rose, I know, was a very important person as well in the community because Paul uh, more or less just lived in Los Angeles. I know we talked about this earlier, that he was... Uh, was, uh, Actually, one year after he built the house. Uh, he was promoted, correct? He got promoted and uh, at the age of 38, was the, he was the youngest president of any railroad uh, in the United States. Isn't that incredible? Right. Uh, and this was uh, a, uh, you know, it was, quote, a $100 million uh, railroad. Uh, it was the Pacific Electric Railroad headquartered in Los Angeles. Now, it was, he was responsible for all of the railroads in Northern California, but also the elaborate interurban system that mm -hmm. was in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, actually, so he, in effect, had moved away, although Rose remained in Northern California and, in fact, lived in the house. All right, Stevie, tell us a little bit about Rose, because I think well, she's kind I of been... I think Rose was the original single mother. Uh -huh. I mean, he was in L.A., and she was very much a part of the community. She raised her three children. She started, she was one of those founding members of the Episcopal Church, which was at that time where the Foothill Congregational Church is mm -hmm. now. And so she was instrumental in helping build that building and fundraising in order to start that church. She did Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and um, I think she was, did a lot of things with Josephine Duvenek. She was just a real pillar of the community. Mm -hmm. She had a finger in every pie and was just a stalwart. And, That's uh, interesting. She and was one of the first sponsors of the uh, Children's Convalescent Hospital up at Stanford. At Stanford. 
And I know he was on the trustee board at Stanford, yep. and she was also involved with the Stanford uh, Convalescent Hospital for Children, correct? Right, right. So they were very intimately involved with Stanford. Yeah. Um, and Hoover. <laughs> and Hoover, you know, the Hoover connection, which we might be able to, to go off on an, yeah. at another time. But let's, let's talk about 500 University okay. because uh, that's such an important house in our town, and people uh, come uh, from all over to, mm -hmm. to, look, to see it. I know that you have people uh, peering over <laughs> <laughs> into your, in, into your okay. dining room windows all the time. But um, I know, Stevie, that uh, the house is is a, a really uh, your, it has been your family home now for 27 years. Right. What are some of the features that make it so, so unique and so craftsmanlike? Well, I think the the most craftsmanlike room probably is the dining room because it is has so many built-ins. And the craftsman homes did have a lot of built-ins. Has a buffet built-in, china cabinets, um, a built-in um, window seat. And then it has paneling. The whole room is paneled, and there are ceiling beams, and lidded glass. And on the um, china cabinets are leaded glass in a, in a pattern that is repeated on one of the uh, sliding doors in another part of the house. And these are all original to the house. All so original, nothing has been handled. Nothing. Well, we did have a major earthquake. We and did, a didn't lot we? <laughs> of, a lot of damage. In 1989. 1989. But in the dining room, the fireplace did fall in, and we had bricks on the floor. But And so the fireplace has been rebuilt. But everything else in the dining room is still original. Well, that's a, that's that's really makes it... So. Uh, be beloved, I think, right, you know, in terms right. of, you know, not having ha having much change. Right. So um, I understand that there have been some remodels, you know, not, you, you've done... We've done, well, of course, in the 89 earthquake, but... Uh, the major may one, yeah. Maybe John want to tell you about the yeah. ones we think that the okay. shops did. Well, uh, the house was built in 10, 1910, yeah. but we believe there were two remodels by the shops, probably in about 1924 and again in 1932. Uh, we're not sure what was done when, but we do know that in those two remodels, the house originally had a very large uh, south-facing porch that went around the uh, lower part or the south part of the house. And in one of those remodels, that porch was enclosed and brought into the house uh, so that we have a, it extended the uh, living room and extended the library. And uh, also, we think there were a number of other, uh, you know, bathrooms and kitchens and things like that that were remodeled in the course of that time period. And then you remodeled it once in 19... Well, we remodeled the kitchen in the 80s. In 80. But then the major, major remodel was in, in 89, well, in 90, when we updated. Once we tore it apart, the earthquake tore it apart, and we put it back together. So we brought it up to code and did the plumbing and electrical and new um, shear walls and that sort of thing. And then we really All that stuff that doesn't show but doesn't costs lots show, of money, right? costs lots of money, <laughs> right, That's but right. makes us feel secure. Right. Well, uh, Stevie and John have been so kind to invite us uh, to uh, come into their home, and we're going to be actually visiting them this Saturday and uh, having them show us firsthand what some of those features of their home look like. Um, so uh, we're, we'll probably at that same time be talking a little bit about, a little bit more about Wolf and McKenzie, the, the architects of the home, and uh, get a little bit of flavor for uh, 500 University. So let's roll that tape now. We're here uh, on a beautiful Saturday uh, morning with Stevie and John. We didn't get to talk very much, John, in the studio about Wolf and McKenzie. What, what can you tell us about them? Well, Wolf and McKenzie formed a partnership, an architectural partnership, uh, right around the turn of the century. And they built homes in the San Jose, Gilroy area for about uh, 11 or 12 years. Among their houses are actually four that are listed on the National Registry, including the Griffin House, uh, they did the old uh, City Hall in, in Gilroy, and, and a number of other structures. They were operating 
uh, in the Craftsman style, which was very popular at that time, uh, very similar to the green and green uh, activity down in Pasadena. Uh, in this particular house, which was done in the last year of their partnership, uh, that is 1910, uh, you'll see a number of features that are characteristic of their work. Uh, about, they built several hundred houses in the area, but you'll notice, first of all, the overhanging roof with the, uh, the rhythm of the uh, large, heavy structures to support it. You'll notice the curved roof line, uh, which has this sort of uh, Japanese uh, tilt rise on the end. You'll also notice the architectural glass, which has this uh, very sharp peak, which is a, uh, uh, an architectural feature that's repeated in a number of different ways on the facade. The house was modified in uh, 1924 or 32, uh, and a porch that wrapped around the uh, southern exposure of the house was incorporated into the living room and the uh, library. library. Uh, you'll see it extending out to the left of the house uh, end. Good. So let's go inside now and see some of those other craftsman's features that were had been incorporated in, into, uh, into the home. So okay. let's go. Now, Stevie, I know this, this dining room has been painted and you've redecorated, but this is primarily the, the, the same room that it was in 1910. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is definitely a craftsman room. Can you... Tell us a little bit about well, it. I think craftsman, the term, comes from the fact that the people who built these houses were true craftsmen in that they did the woodwork. They took great pride in their craft. And I think you can see a lot of that in this room, starting with the built, all the built-in wall at the end of the room, which has china cabinets and a buffet. Beautiful. Um, and a lot of detail in the uh, woodwork and the drawers and everything. The paneling throughout the room is all hand done. And very craftsman-like. very craftsman and very rectangular. The beams, are, you find beams in practically all craftsman houses. And then the window seat behind us is a very craftsman-esque detail. The thing that is kind of unusual about this house is the curves that the architect designer has chosen to put in. Um, the curve above the um, buffet, the curves, the columns, and the corner um, of the molding around the doors is, is curved. Most doors in Craftsman houses have a square squared off corner. So this is, the curve is very unusual. The only thing that has really been changed in this room is the fireplace. And it was damaged in the Loma Prieta quake. So in 1989, we had bricks falling down the chimney and all out into the middle of the floor here. So the fireplace has been redesigned and repositioned. It's smaller than the original one. And the paneling around the fireplace is new, but matches matches the old. So these lighting fixtures are? Oh, and the lighting fixtures, again, the Craftsman squared off look. These are brass lighting fixtures mm -hmm. that um, are like the ones that were here. Replicas. Replic mm -hmm. These are replicas. The new, the old ones were absolutely exactly the same, but to have them repolished and everything was more expensive than putting in new ones. So we went the new route on that. I think we're going to go outside now, Stevie, and we have a special treat in store. So let's do that now. OK. We're here in the backyard of uh, Stevie and John's uh, beautiful home here on U University. And I'd like you to uh, meet uh, Fumiko Kagawa Lee. Uh, Fumiko was born on this property. Your father was the caretaker, That's correct? That's right. That's right. Uh huh. And they lived here for? My father lived here for 30 years, my father and mother, and I lived here for 20 years. So you must have a lot of memories, Fumiko. Yes, I do. I have a lot of wonderful childhood memory of the creek and the playground and the tennis court and the beautiful garden. And I, I think you have a, a 
a picture to share with us today yes, I do. about uh, what this property actually looked like. Do you have the picture? Yes, I know we're going to put this up on the monitor uh, later, but um, this is, what can you tell us about this, this, this picture? Is a, this is a Japanese garden my father built. It's a beautiful garden with koi fishes in it and, and water lilies and waterfall. It was just a beautiful Japanese garden. Everybody that came here just admired this garden. Oh, it's, 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 beautiful. it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And I know you told me that you and your brothers uh, like to uh, uh, play in Adobe Creek, yeah, correct? Yeah, that's why we used to play in the creek, and run around in the creek. And, and my father built a windmill in the creek. <laughs> a windmill? Yeah, a windmill. I think I have a picture of that, too. And uh, we really enjoyed it here. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I know this has been a kind of a, a, a walk down memory lane for you, and you haven't been back here for quite a long time, have you, Fumiko? That's right. This is the first time I'm back here since I came back. And well, How I many had... years? It's been over 50 years now. Oh, that's marvelous. <laughs> that's a long time. Well, we feel very uh, fortunate to have been the facilitator in introducing you to John and Stevie Day. And uh -huh. I hope that you've enjoyed your uh, visit here to 500 University. We certainly have enjoyed meeting you. Yeah. So uh, that's about all we have time for today. Uh, we've enjoyed our visit here with John and Stevie and Famika Lee. Um, please join us next time, and uh, thank you for watching the Los Altos History Show. See you next time.